Hello and welcome to The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, uh, and my producer tells me that uh, we may have just lost one of our guests. We should probably put bells on them. Okay, um, we will do our best behind the scenes to just uh, make it happen. Big uh, shout out to everybody already here in the comments. Uh, wonderful to see everyone being functional, punctual right on time. Um, and a quick apology, though, to Scott. We may mention soybeans at some point tonight because tonight's topic is really cropping and intercropping and yes soybeans do make an appearance hate to break it to you okay yes that is tonight's topic but before we get to that uh, fantastic discussion a quick reminder of course that if you uh, collect those ceu credits head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning let us know you took in the program and you can qualify for those lovely ceu credits and um of course this show does have sponsors and we are so appreciative for them uh to support the show and make it happen so of course our show sponsors include adama canada and the pests and predators podcast and tomorrow's uh webinar so it's a real agriculture webinar on flea beetle management that goes at 8 p 8 a.m mountain tomorrow morning um and of course adama canada is our main show sponsor as well well, other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Okay, um, big, big shout out to Patrick Berkeley is on, Francois Tardif as well. Um, and yes, Scott, that is new music. Jay finally got around to changing it. So thank you, producer Jay. All right, we are, I think, yes, we are ready with our guests. All right, out of Ontario, from Tilsonburg, from Van Muir Farms, I've got Greg Vermeer here, I think. Greg, are you here? You are. Okay, wonderful. And out of Manitoba, I've got Scott Chalmers, uh, based at Melita, Manitoba, here joining us tonight. So welcome, Greg. Welcome, Scott. Thanks for being here. All righty. Now, okay, Scott, can you hear us okay? Oh, I'm not sure. We're gonna use our we're gonna use our guest chat maybe. Okay, Jay, can you see if Scott? We'll start with Greg because we're not sure Scott can hear us. All right, Greg. All right, Tilsonburg. What is happening this week in your area? What do the crops look like? Uh, it's dry, really mm. dry. Uh, we haven't had really any rain since I'd say beginning of June to the end of May, it's, it's dry. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can like, hear me. Hey, I can't, oh, hear now we can. I can't see oh, anything. Okay. Just the 301 time on the, on the screen. Oh no. Scott is okay. All right. We are, hang on, dealing with a few tech issues. It must be, it must be stuck. Um, Okay, we'll try. We'll get that going. There we go. We'll bring Scott back in a bit. All right, Greg. Okay, so super dry. What were conditions like uh, with the crop going in the ground this spring? Super wet. Ah, okay. Yeah. Not ideal. No, not uh, no. nothing like last year. That's for sure. Yeah, I don't know if we're allowed to ask for something like last year twice in a row. That's getting a little greedy. I think <laughs> maybe. Scott, can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Yeah. Yay! Scott's here. Okay. This is wonderful. All right. We have been sort of navigating some tech issues. So, Scott, a uh, question to you. So, not many people probably know where Melita, Manitoba is uh, if they're out of Ontario, but we have plenty of Westerners watching as well. But you're in the western part of the province. How do the crops look around Melita? Yeah. Um... The crops are looking actually pretty good considering uh, what we've all gone through in the last two years. Um, last year was an extreme drought and uh, nobody should have been smoking last year because the crop would have just lit up just like firecrackers. And now this year, uh, everybody needs a boat. So um, we've had, I'm not sure how much rain, at least in the 140 millimeter range since uh, we started measuring in the middle of May. And then we had two or three blizzards before that. Uh, so while we went from drought all the way in 
back into extreme uh, moisture conditions. So, but we've been lucky. We got the, we snuck the crop in and everything looks super green right now. All right. Growing is good. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. So our topic tonight, relay cropping and intercropping. These of course are similar things but not quite the same. And um, I've got two clips tonight that sort of talk about the difference. Uh, but Greg, I'll start with you. What is a relay crop and what sorts of relay crops have you been working with? Uh, a relay crop is kind of like, I always think of it as a race where you're the guys handing off the baton to the next race or going around the track. Um, you know, it's basically seeding one crop before the other one's done. So it's always got something living in the soil. Okay. And which crops have you, have you mostly been working with? Oh, um, geez, we did hybrid rye, common rye and barley. And then we're playing with the heat units of the soybeans a little bit to try to tweak that. Okay, so why rye and barley and not wheat? Great question. Where we are, it's just too sandy for wheat and it's probably too sandy for barley. We're trying to use the barley uh, for the harvest harvestability. And really, when you see some of the pictures that I think you have, um, the rye just clearly is better on our sandy soils with drought. Okay. All right. Um, Scott, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know what? I feel like it's a, it's a July 4th. So, you know, happy Independence Day down in the States. We just had Canada Day. I feel like this maybe should have been a holiday Monday. And the technical <laughs> stuff is just <laughs> trying to tell us that it should have been, but it's not. Um, okay, Scott, now, um, relay cropping, not necessarily what you're looking at you are looking more and a lot of the research you've done is on intercropping so what's the difference what's an intercrop versus a relay crop well i consider an intercrop one where you perhaps uh seed and harvest at the same time or at least harvest at the same time and then deal with it later of maybe separating the crops and for relay uh i like to think of it as um at least growing two crops or more together but uh you're u utilizing resources on the shoulder seasons, for example, where you're, um, you know, taking advantage of uh, those warm days in April and May uh, where nothing's really happening or in October when the crop's gone and but you still have a few cattle or something to run around the country, um, you know, just uh, picking up the slack there, using more resources. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Scott, you did, you sent, um, you might actually win an award for the most slides sent ahead of, a, of an episode of The Agronomist because there is so much work. So I was actually like quite, quite sort of taken aback by just how many years uh, Wado has been, been doing some of this work and how much data there was onto so many different mixes. So we're gonna, we, we only have an hour, so we're gonna focus on some of the most common ones, but run us through, you know, sort of some of the variations of this intercrop that you've looked at. Uh, sorry, for which one? Uh, just run us through sort of an example of, of the different types of intercrops you've done at Melita, <laughs> cause there's a lot. I, I've lost count. Uh, um, you guys were referring to my 200 plus slides for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh scott keeps you keep freezing scott but we'll make it through jay let's bring up uh, some of those it, slides that, yeah it uh it blew me away i think in 2009 uh that's or 2008 maybe when we first started it but uh um just uh we'll see what you got here yeah which one are we <laughs> let's which one's the next one i think there's I think if I remember correctly, yeah, so this is one of the more common ones, which is canola pea, which okay, we sometimes yeah. call peola. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, and that one's relatively common, but but walk us through why canola and, and peas seem to work well together. Right. We picked those uh, because they're easy to separate at harvest and they, they mature at the same time. Uh, but there could be other things here too going on, uh, which we presume are happening. We have uh, a shallow rooting 
pea and a deep rooting canola. And so uh, maybe the canola is sourcing water from the deeps. Uh, He has frozen again. Okay. I mean, at least he doesn't look angry when he freezes, but he freezes. <laughs> maybe James <laughs> trying to tell you he needs a raise or something there. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, he's and just maybe, pressing uh, the pause a lady button. By the name of Reed for there a last name under Jeff Shono, and uh, they found uh, over 30 pounds an acre of nitrogen could be potentially shared between pea and mustard. So I don't see why not with canola. Uh, and I believe there's potentially studies going on this year. All right, so we missed. I'll just hang up here and try again. Yeah, okay, we'll come <laughs> back. All right, um, yeah, yeah, Scott, Scott says, so when talking about the nitrogen sharing, um, and Scott was referring to some work that that's certainly the peas contribute, um, to the nitrogen. Scott Gillespie says, I call it nitrogen stealing as peas don't give because they feel nice. So is it <laughs> sharing or is it stealing? I <laughs> think uh, really the peas point. naturally just put a, a rhizosphere of nitrogen around and then maybe the bugs and, uh, um, you know, those bacteria that change um, compounds around, I, I think they give it up to the canola and the canola is a good scavenger uh, and potentially the peas are changing the pH of the soil. And so therefore more nutrients are, are available for the canola. Uh, mm, but uh, okay. if you can imagine, say you're in a drought situation, the, the canola has uh, rooted out really deep. I want to hear what he's saying, but we keep <laughs> losing it. Uh, oh. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Greg, it's all you. It's the Greg show. Okay, so so now there are, there are some interesting sort of differences between intercropping. So something like this where you're going to harvest them at the same time and finding some of those symbiotic relationships. And then relay cropping where, yes, you're handing off that baton. So you're, you're widening your, your growing window, right? So you, you, the crop starts sooner, um, growing right in the spring. And then, of course... Um, you're going to harvest the next crop after. So what are, so we're not necessarily going to get nitrogen sharing per se. I know the peas sometimes climb on the canola, so there's maybe an advantage there. But what are some of the reasons that you want to intercrop, Greg? Or relay crop, sorry. Yep. Oh, he's back now. <laughs> it's okay. Scott, I'll come back to you. Greg's going to tell us why, what benefits he's he's got out of relay cropping. Um we're trying to get more cereals in the rotation here and still make money at it. So that was the push. Um, we're seeing a five to seven bushel gain in corn following a cereal crop on wheat or rye and then two to three bushel on soybeans. So we're just trying to get cereals in more rotation on acres, but then also you yeah, got to make some money at it too. So, you know, the soybeans, with the relay add a nice uh, kick per acre. Uh, last year, I mean, we had record rainfall and it was just ideal for double cropping. And I think our double crop soybeans beat out my relays by like four bushels, so. Mm. That's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. um, now last year was maybe pretty incredible for a lot of reasons in Ontario. Sorry, Western yeah. Canada, uh, but yeah. it was kind of amazing. So, so there is that. Okay, Gord Speck Snyder here in Ontario has a question because there are some piola acres happening in Ontario. So, um, and even just this year, I've noticed um, people tramping through fields. Notwithstanding, there there maybe is a bit more interest in canola, winter canola, uh, here in Ontario. Um, but um, I think Scott has has frozen again and that's too bad because this is a question for him about stealing these things okay so i want to greg i want to talk about um so kevin says here in our area some use annual rye planted into corn at side dress timing the rye grows all winter and is silaged in the spring now he is in bc and in the fraser valley so that's a pretty pretty different climate than i think most of us would be dealing with but that is that's a pretty fantastic way to make feed um and certainly keep that ground covered for 
for a big part of the year for sure. So that is pretty cool. Um, okay, well, wait. Uh, you know what? Why don't we go to? Uh, we're gonna go to our first clip. That's gonna set up um, this sort of concept of the shoulder season and intercepting more light and these sorts of things. So this is a clip of Jason Mock. If any of you know of Jason, he does some really cool stuff down in the States. Um, he's been doing some intercropping, relay cropping. He's been putting livestock in between the rows, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so we'll go to this clip because Jason sort of explains the concept of growing multiple species and, and that shoulder season. Um, and then we'll get to some of these really great questions on peas and nitrogen and canola. Scott, if you want to check out the comments while we go uh, to this clip with Jason Mock. So by definition, relay cropping is two crops that uh, come off at two different time periods. And, you know, polycropping or intercropping would be too similar. So relay would be like wheat and soybeans. Poly would be like corn and soybeans or something else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so what is a combination that you – I've seen a lot of your videos where you're using corn and, and – or sorry, soybeans and wheat, but you're mm -hmm. not limited to that. Right, right, right. And I, I, I did not bring a – Visual conversation, visual thing, but this is my uh, graph. This is what intercropping is all about: is milking the curve. And as we decrease our amount of plants, we get more plant yield. Um, so when we look at relay cropping, there's a huge opportunity there because the wheat is way ahead of the soybeans. So all those little tiny leaves on the side of the wheat can be empowered. And what we can do is we can get two or three or four heads per wheat seed and we can ban nutrients. So that lowers our variable costs. And then we can set up the next crop and create this venue of awesomeness or awesome sauce. So we can get solar intrusion when the beans are making pods. We can use the corpse of the wheat to keep the ground cool and preserve moisture. And we can extract moisture when there's too much of it. So I look at these relay crops not as, hey, we're going to just – you know, feed the world and produce more crops. It's more of how can we utilize different variables to aggregately make more profitability and replace costs. All right, so Patrick um, calls Jason Mock the Elon Musk of agriculture. And I think that's uh, that's that's maybe not bad. I kind of like that, Patrick. I might steal that. All right. Before we get rolling here, I uh, do want to, of course, thank our show sponsors once again. Uh, Out of My Canada, the Pest and Predators podcast, um, and uh, our Flea Beetle Beatdown happening tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Mountain. I believe Kara Oosterhouse will be uh, hosting that with Dr. Boyd Murray and James Tanzi. Um, they're going to be talking about what we know, what we don't know. Um, and what uh, what we could be doing differently, perhaps, uh, for management of flea beetles, because those are certainly uh, challenging pests this spring. Okay. All right. Let's talk a bit more about some of the reasons we do this, how we do this, and some of the pitfalls, because there are some of them. Um, now, Scott, did you have a chance, if you're not frozen? Oh, goodness. I think he's frozen again. I do want to talk about this this nitrogen thing because I think that that is at least for the intercropping the nitrogen dynamic is one of the key ones that I think in intercropping is really important. But Greg, you mentioned so maybe let's go to those images. Um, uh, you you mentioned in some of those images some of the crops that have not maybe or that wheat maybe has not done as well, and so you're trying some of these other crops in this relay. And so we did select a couple of the images that you sent that maybe we can look at and you can talk us through um, what has worked well and what maybe hasn't worked as well in the relay. So Jay, producer Jay, if you could bring up some of the row photos. Okay, yeah, so what are we looking at here? Um, so that's the relay this year between the barley and you can just see that the cereals have just taken up all the moisture and there's nothing left there for you. Uh, relays. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this year. That's this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when, so what, what is your ideal timing usually when you're going to put the beans in? Do you go by like calendar date? Do you go by growth stage of the existing crop? How do you, how do you figure that out? 
Uh, it's really simple. I just try to do it before I start planting corn so it doesn't interfere with the clean notes and stuff. So it's really not rocket science <laughs> for me. Uh, May okay, 1st, fair. April 29th, April 30th, like give or take in there is what we try to do because uh, we singulate all the beans at about 120,000 pop. And we did a couple trials last year. I mean, you can see Mother Nature isn't kind this year, but last year the relays got frozen off. Probably 75% of the plot got frost damage. Um, yeah. So every year it has its challenges trying to relay because moisture is your limiting factor. But then also um, like the frost, you're more prone to frost with the cereals and the relays in there as well. Why is that? I, I think they use up more like our heavier cover crop farms are more frost prone as well. And maybe right. it just doesn't let the heat out. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Now, okay, Scott, I don't know if you looked through the comments talking about, so lots of interest in the peas um, and canola discussion. If the canola is using the nitrogen that the peas make, will the peas actually make fix more nitrogen because it's it's essentially making it but not using it? It's going somewhere else. Does it actually stimulate it to make to fix more? I don't know, but I suspect so um, mm -hmm. because they're putting it there for a reason. So they must be needing to put it there for some. I feel we get like ten seconds, Scott. And then we just lose you. We need somebody is trying to upload something at your house. I feel like, and Ray is correct. Um, Scott keeps freezing, but he has a knack for freezing with a good look. Unlike me, who always looks either angry or terrified when my face freezes. Um, okay, we'll get back to Scott. We're trying very hard. Okay, Greg. Uh, I'm kind of surprised we've made it this far into the show, and no one has asked about how you put these crops in the ground. Um, now. Relay cropping is slightly simpler because you make room, right, for the crop that you're going to be adding to the cereal crop. Um, intercropping, I do want to talk to Scott about how you do that because I, I'm pretty sure the crop all goes in at the same time, but I want to get um, the word from him. I will, as we missed it just off the top, I will mention, um, I think Scott went over it, but we missed it. Um, so they have looked at pea and canola. They've looked at some sunflower intercrops. They've looked at, um, there's some vetch intercropping going on. There's, um, I don't know, I think there's like something like 13 different combinations that they have some pretty good data on. So um, Scott, we will we will share that when we can. Um, Scott, I, I swear we get like 10 seconds of your time and then you disappear. Um, okay, so very quickly, because I'm going to ask Greg about getting the crop in. When you are doing your intercrop trials, does everything go down at the same time? How do you plant them, seed them? It depends. Uh, if I'm doing corn vetch, I have to do separate passes, but I do know a producer that can do it all in one pass. Uh, corn or uh, pea canola, yeah, it's, it's the same time. Uh, pea oat, same time. Generally, it's at the same time if we can, but sometimes maybe we broadcast like a clover uh, later on or before seeding or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for those farmers that are trying this on a larger scale, have they done significant modifications of equipment to make it happen, or is it the same idea, broadcast and that sort of stuff, and just make it work? Again, see, we got 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, we're just going to keep rolling. Thank you to Scott for being it's just such a good sport at doing this. All right. So Kyler says, Greg, that you have some pretty deadly equipment, which I think is good. So, um, <laughs> no, I know it's good. So, so we do have, you did send a couple, a couple images of the setup for this. Jay, if we can maybe bring those up. Has this been like an evolution? Was this pretty easy to sort of set up for your farm? Walk me through what you have now for equipment and, and how you've sort of changed it around. Um, geez, we started this probably three years ago. And I guess the idea was um, I don't want to get into specialized equipment just yet until the concept works and like there's a return. So there you're seeing the corn planter. 
um, going through, oh, geez, probably April 29th this year we planted. And that would have been the rye. You can see it's uh, out of dormancy and it looks good. Um, the tractor does, if you look to your left, drive over the rows as well mm -hmm. as the tracks. But I think that's why we're trying to do it early enough so it doesn't damage the uh, twin row crops in there. But um, the fall time, we just take a John Deere 1890 drill and just plug some rows. And then we keep the seeding rates and the fertility the same um, on the twin rows. So there's really not much difference in solid seeding, just row spacing. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Um, now what do you do for, what do you do for tillage before seeding in the fall or planting in the fall? There's nothing. It's, if nothing? we don't have okay. to till, we don't. So, yep. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And this is, this is raw, you said, right? Yep, this looks pretty yep. uh, green and out of dormancy. So this would be the rye. Okay, yep. Now, and you, so you've also tried barley, winter barley. So that was that uh, other image, right? Okay, yeah. so yeah, what? We're doing strips. So I planted it with a 40 foot air seeder and then we just share the uh, AB lines in the spring with this tractor and then go through mm -hmm. and um, do it. And then the sprayer luckily can fold down to 80 feet. So. Um, you'll see the yeah. barley is like, we didn't do any damage to the barley because it's still, you know, it was planted late and it really, really didn't hurt it at all. Or the rye, it did impact the rye a little bit, but it's pretty nominal, I think, considering you're driving over it so early. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, although, as you said, so that is actually quite, quite impressive, though, if it was wet. So, yes, you're in there early, but even in wet conditions the damage you're saying was not awful. Yeah. Like this is one of those farms where you're making pottery at one end of the farm and you're setting your, uh, you know, tents or beach chairs up at the other end. So yeah. it, right. There's a lot of variability here. All right. Okay. So Francois wants to know how long after planting corn is the rye terminated and how? After plant. So before the relays go in, it would be soybeans. Okay. Because you're, because you're taking, this is rye, you're taking the grain off. Right? Correct. Yeah. We're not yeah. burning, we're not burning this off. We're taking it to seed. And then yep. um, you probably saw some of the clips last year. Where we just took tile over the knives and we were yep. able to harvest it pretty respectably, but. Yep. So, and now, okay, and so then the beans go in before you start planting corn. I like this rule, that that's easy enough. Um, walk us through, and we will hopefully get Scott back, um, but walk us through when you harvest, you're obviously, you don't want to damage the beans if they're there, which I'm guessing there are years that they don't, they're not as robust as you would maybe like them. Um, so how do you manage that? How do you how do you sort of manage that you want to get a good harvest, but you don't want to necessarily impact the beans? Um, good question. The over the years, I'd say the beans don't mind getting driven over because they're still kind of know, pretty flexible at that point. They just don't like haircuts. It seems like when we clip the top of the beans with a knife, they never they never come out of it great. So that's kind of what we're finding. Interesting. Okay. Okay, Scott, I hope you're back. I feel like we have used up all of your patience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so, lost my patience with Comstream. I, uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. You can get very angry with them at some point. Um, okay. So we've, we've talked a little about the crop going in. Um, We've talked a bit about fertility, of course, not extensively, um, but one of the questions, and there will be many more, but one of the questions, of course, is always on harvest. Um, so we do have, I think, a, a, I got Jay to pull a picture or two of separating the crop after harvest, because it's always a question, uh, whether it's canola and peas or, or whatever you're doing, how do you separate them after? So walk us through some of the examples of that um on on how these crops are managed coming off the field
Jay will just take a second to switch over to the treasure trove of slides we have. Sorry, Jay. Did I throw it? <laughs> Did I throw throw that one out of left field at you? My apologies. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a producer growing pea and canola, and they're able to keep up with a 9600 using this quick clean system. And they <sighs> We were doing so well. Okay, Scott, you're back. I can hear you anyway, sort of. Try. Oh, goodness. This is really frustrating. Maybe there's only so much internet on the 4th of July, right? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Or maybe it's in Manitoba. Somebody else is using all the Manitoba internet. Um, yeah. Okay, we are going to... Jay, just leave this up because this is really fascinating. And I have actually seen this done once or twice in that they they essentially separate it right as it comes off the field because of course canola and pea are easy to separate from each other because there's such a huge size difference between the two seeds um but you cannot let them sit uh like say overnight or something like that because the canola will fill all the little air spaces around the peas and you will get respiration and you will just get a mess so not a good idea that's the one tip i learned about intercropping is when you separate it separate it quickly um and then it goes into the bins from there so we'll leave that up for now um now greg let's talk a little bit about um when we talk about relay cropping or intercropping intercropping maybe more so they I don't know if you talk about land use equivalents but it's this idea that you know an acre can produce x so by growing two crops you may get less of each crop but the sum total is more than what you would have had if you just grew one right so does that type of math factor into when you're doing this as to whether or not it's successful oh for sure i mean to continue farming you got to make money in the end right so we all, I think, love it, but you got to be a manager and it's about uh, the dollars and cents. Um, I think in one of the soil networks, we had a really good conversation and I was worried about having two bean crops back to back because that's essentially what we're doing. And was there a negative impact on the soil? So even though we're putting a cereal in there, are we still like negative because we have two beans in there, like soil biology, soil right. health? So, and I think after some conversations, it was kind of like, yeah, you're probably net ahead a little bit as far as soil health goes. But I know with all the rains last year, which is pretty hard to come by two years in a row, we're, you know, financially won't see those uh, returns per acre. So, but it's, it's right. a balancing. Yeah. There's always that there's yield per acre. And then there's also profit per acre and you're right last year probably isn't going to happen again um, but maybe you know there's always a chance um but uh, uh so you've i mean you've mentioned soil health we this is something that you know yes you've got to be able to pay your bills to continue farming um but part of the part of the concept in doing this isn't just about profitability either it's about trying to leverage some of the qualities of say, as you said, having a, a cereal in rotation, but still keeping still keeping the bills paid. So with apologize to anyone um, who loves their wheat crop, but cereals don't usually pay all those bills. So um, have you noticed any, now I know you've only been doing this a couple of years, but have you noticed, you mentioned soil health, but any, have you noticed any say weed spectrum or weed uh, suppression? with having any crops in those shoulder seasons, anything like that that you've taken note of? Um, really, there's nothing. I think we, 24 hours before we plant the beans or a two day window, we do buttural M. And that seems to keep everything pretty clean until we're able to harvest. Um, you know, <laughs> even with a little bit of soil disturbance from the equipment going through it really, you know, cause there's a lot of trash It's probably you know, half inch to an inch of trash cover that we're seeding through at all times. So the weeds generally aren't an issue so far. And then as soon as the cereals are harvested, we just drive through the 30 inch beans, do a pass a roundup and that's really it. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it worked out well last year. So. Okay. All right. Um, now I'm, 
I'm hoping we will get Scott back. I really am. Um, and I'm sure there are many people who uh, maybe want to see some footage of some of these relay beans. So I did pull a clip. Um, and Greg, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. And, and frankly, you're going to have to because we don't have another guest. Um, but uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. This is, this is a clip that Pete, Wheat Pete did, uh, I think, ending in 2019. So we've had a couple years now. Um, and the years that you've been doing this. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see the difference here. So now Scott is back just as we're about to go to a clip. So Scott, while we have you for 10 seconds, explain how these things get separated and then we're going to a clip. Uh, they separate decently. Uh, they keep up to the speed of a combine and it potentially is important to separate the crops in order to prevent moisture from transferring from one to the next. Uh, and keep in mind the bushel weight of a intercrop of pea canola is about 74 pounds a bushel. So uh, you don't want to load the truck too heavy because you may not get out of the field. Yeah, because it, yeah, so I had, I would say when we lost you, the, the canola basically fills all the gaps between the peas, right? So, That's right. like, yeah, it's, it's just, it's super airtight. heavy and super dense. Yeah. So, and then from this, they would go, so they, they dump into just the separator. The separator then augers them into either bins or trucks to be moved to wherever they're going. Right. And then they can put yeah. it on and here this, or not or whatever. Exactly. And this may not be perfect because the peas are going through an auger and that's uh, going to damage the hole. Uh, you want to kind of keep that intact. But for the canola, it's great. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to go to a clip on the the relay of, of wheat and beans, and then we're going to come back and hopefully, Scott, we've got you now um, and cover uh, a couple of the really cool graphs that you've got that show some of the reasons for doing this, the economics um, and some of those things. So Jay, if you can pull this, that clip uh, on relay beans, this takes us to 2019 here in Ontario. We are going to talk about relay intercropping. So this is a really cool idea that came out of some innovative farmers in the United States. And what we do is we plant twin row wheat. So two seven and a half inch rows every 30 inches. And then that's winter wheat, of course, do that in the fall and skip the other two rows. And then in the spring, we come in and we plant soybeans. And then we harvest the wheat, the soybeans take off and they grow. And in the US, like some of the farmers like Jason Mock, oh my gosh, 100 bushel per acre soybeans or more in that system. Well, can't Ontario do that? Well, of course we can. Well, maybe we can. So this is the second year of the project and two totally different years. Really cool. Year one, super dry June. Our early planted wheat so outcompeted the soybeans, they simply died. Out of three sites, all replicated, good solid information, Two of them, well, one of them in particular, zero yield. The soybeans died. Another one, nothing to combine, but we did a hand sample, five bushels per acre. The other site, a little bit later, planted 17 bushels per acre. Now, 2019 data, and you can see that the wheat was late planted. It never really canopied. So if ever you're going to try to do this and you're planting wheat late, this is not a bad strategy because the wheat won't be as competitive. If the wheat's planted early, it's just too competitive in Ontario. So we get less competitive wheat. Gosh, this year, 2019, it should work. So what is the outcome? Well, first off, when you watch this combine video, man, we have real challenges to combine the wheat and not damage the soybeans. And lots of people have tried different things, shoes and everything. We just use tile, that's okay. But as we push that tile down in, we don't always get all the wheat. So what we did is we did some, twin row wheat without the soybeans, I can guarantee you that whether you plant soybeans or not, you will take at least a 10% yield hit in the wheat. Because where we didn't plant the soybeans, we still lost 10% in wheat yield. So that's one of the things you got to factor into it. If you do the perfect job, and by the way, if anybody has a row crop header for a John Deere 6600 combine, we want it because we'd like to try this one more year and get every kernel out of that wheat crop. Now you look at the soybean harvest and three sites where, gosh, we got not competitive wheat. What do we see? Well, not competitive wheat. Dang, grass weed pressure. We can spray the broad leaves out. And as soon as you have that gap where you're gonna plant the soybeans, you have more weed pressure. But we didn't think about grass weed pressure. It can be horrendous because you don't have the wheat canopy to hold those weeds down. 
We did the best we could. As soon as the wheat came off, we sprayed with glyphosate, all those things. Nonetheless, grass weeds are a bit of an issue. And the outcome on the soybean harvest, well, we ranged from 12 to 21 bushels per acre. So on the year where we thought we did everything right, we still only got about 20 bushel per acre soybeans. Uh, could we have done better if we had a row crop head and you know we damaged the soybeans a little bit, but we haven't yet got the system where we can challenge 100 bushel per acre soybeans in a relay intercropping wheat uh, program, that's for sure. So That's for sure, he says. All right, okay, quickly before we get back at it, and I really, Scott has so many fascinating things to say. Um, I really hope he comes back. Okay, um, but a big thank you to our show sponsors, Adama Canada, Tomorrow's Flea Beetle Beat Down, and of course, the Pests and Predators podcast. Uh, three full seasons, some great discussions there um, on all those friends in the field brought to you by Field Heroes. So you hear from a different entomologist every week on some uh, pretty amazing predators that live in the canopy and are our friends in the field. So check that out. Uh, realagriculture.com slash podcast and you can download those there okay so uh heading into now i did ask scott um offline about some of the poor doers so the less successful intercrops because they have looked at so many uh greg i think we've we've you know we've identified that you know, for your system, you're definitely looking at rye at being more competitive um, and barley because of the dryness factor. What do you think of that video from Wheat Peak coming up to 2019? What do you think? So you've sort of from that point have continued onward. Is the 20 bushel beans, is that enough? Is that going to pay bills? It's, Maybe this uh, year? It's a little too <laughs> tight for me. I mean, I kind of like the 40 bushel range would be nice. I mean, Maybe more like Jason okay. Mock in a few years, we'll get to a hundred bushel one day. But I mean, you got to try these things and you got to, I mean, they're not making more land and you just got to keep, uh, it's too expensive to buy. So, you know, what are you doing to be innovative and competitive these days? So this is kind of, you got to solve problems like this. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Scott, um, having looked at so many different combinations at Wado, what have been some of the ones that you just sort of said, not going to work doesn't work that would be uh soybean and winter wheat that was brutal um because uh, we just don't have the moisture um four to five years and uh i'm hard pressed to believe that on the fifth year when we do have moisture it's going to work on paper uh unless you're using say roundup ready ones and you got a great wheat price and life is lovely that way but uh, you just can't make money going over the field twice for not only seeding, but for harvest. That's just crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in, what in was, at we... least in our area, for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, for down, sure. And, and that's just... south, yeah. yeah, but no. Um, what do you think has been one of the most successful? You, I think you missed, you mentioned it at the top, but we missed it. Yeah, peak and all is great. Um, I would say also uh, we have a prospect with corn and hairy vetch. Um, that reason is because it uh, fits well in the cattle industry here uh, as a feed. Uh, and we're uh, super pumping up our protein value per acre and our feed values, our, qu our feed quality, uh, that sort of thing. So um, I think there's huge so potential that's a, there. Is that a silage then? Is that what you mean? Or yeah, how is you, that? Uh, a lot of... It could be uh, just grazing corn with uh, okay. yep. a little bit extra protein below. Um, but uh, yeah. you could take it off for grain. You just got to make sure your hybrid is uh, cobs up high, that sort of thing. For the silage guys, uh, there's a lot of swearing going on with uh, the reaper going through and getting all tangled up with vetch. <laughs> so you got to take it a little higher. And uh, yeah. everybody gets greedy because they want to put the header down low and, and get yeah. more. So. Mm -hmm. But then they regret that. And then they call you and say, Scott, right. why did I do this? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, you don't listen. <laughs> yeah. so, they get it. Yeah, they, exactly. they, you know, they get the concept, but it, when it, uh, when tires hit the pavement, uh, it makes the difference of really uh, the yeah. economics and mechanics of things. And so why Harry Vetch and not a Clover? Why is Harry Vetch a better fit? 
Well, it seems to uh, be very glyphosate tolerant. And then I mean that as in uh, we're putting on, uh, you know, almost three quarters of a liter of 540 onto the crop and it just laughs at us and keeps growing. It, it does take a two week holiday, but uh, it allows the corn to get ahead. And then the vetch takes over basically in September, hmm. October when the corn is all done. Yep. So uh, it's kind of our relay here that seems to be promising anyway. Very interesting. Okay, so Kevin out uh, in that magical land that is the Fraser Valley says, with our land values, yield per acre is huge. Relay cropping allows for better manure management and are, we're able to capture the nutrients over the winter. Um, and so that, of course, has often played in with cover cropping, with holding those nutrients where we want them. Um, Greg, do you have any access to any brown gold that you can work into the system? Sorry, what was the question again? Sorry, yeah. Do you do you have any manure that you can work into your system? Um, we do. Like, if we have cereals, we'll call those our project farms for the guys. So once uh, there's no relays, then we'll try to do like manure management, lime, uh, fence rows, cleanups yep. like that. So yeah, we do have access to it, but uh, it's not uh, not always the right price. But it's it's really hard in our area because. Uh, Things are very competitive with vegetables and ginseng and stuff. So those guys are right. usually the biggest consumers of manure. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, Tilsonburg used to be, didn't it used to be tobacco land around there? Yeah. So There's still Tom, some. I had, yeah. <laughs> I had, I had, I think it was four years ago was the first time I ever saw tobacco growing in a field. So that tells you how much I had toured around Ontario. Um, <laughs> but I did actually see some. It's, I was like, what is that? Anyway, it was very different than I thought um, tobacco would look like growing. But there you go. Um, I was also shocked by how Brussels sprouts grow. So what do I know? Um, anyway, okay. So now Scott, Scott looks frozen again. But Ray DeBenko, uh, Adelbert out of Alberta has a good question. What can be said about the protein production needs for peas and the prospect of FNMICs? Um, and so I will wait till Scott comes back on, but Ray, this this question, and I think Kara, my colleague Kara, uh, who is hosting tomorrow's webinar, um, I think Kara is also in the chat and uh, a pulse grower as well. And I would say for Manitoba, Scott, maybe can you, this is related, but somewhat off topic, um, the threat of aphanomyces in peas, I know that Manitoba, many Manitoba growers probably nixed the peas this year because of the moisture and how late it got. Um, is that an increasing concern uh, for intercropping or, or for parts of Manitoba? It is for me. Uh, we have uh, a few pea processing plants here in, uh, in the province. And uh, what the demand is from them is not what we can produce. And so it kind of pressurizes the rotation pot that we're having to grow more peas more often potentially. So uh, I know we have a phanomyces in the area, at least where I'm from, and uh, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just straight eight year rotation. plus rotation um, at this point. Wow. Uh, we're looking into things, we have ideas, but uh, um, very far out right now in uh, in terms of definite answer. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, a lot of those pea acres that left Manitoba went to Saskatchewan, um, but Saskatchewan has a definite aphanomyces issue. And so, yeah, if you can't grow a crop more than once in eight years or, or once in seven years or something like that, it really limits the acres you can add. Um, and so to Ray's point, you're right. We've got processors that are going to need the crop and it is going to be increasingly difficult to grow it. So maybe that's where intercropping could work in and that you could potentially uh, work it onto some of those canola acres, who knows, um, might be able to bump up some of that stuff. So Scott, who is blinking for a very long time, um, I will send a shout out. Anyone who's watching from the West, because I know there are plenty of you that do watch, um, although are less likely to comment, Ray notwithstanding. Um, Scott's got some really great work and some really fantastic research and, and graphs that uh, we couldn't get to all of them tonight at all. Um, and so if you're interested in some of those findings, just uh, zip me a note and I will get them to you. Um, also, I am taking requests for topics and guests over the summer uh, because we're still going to be here every Monday night regardless. Anyway, um, okay, Greg, who is blinking and I can see, um, so is live. What <laughs> you have mentioned, this is like third 
third-ish season doing this. What has been one of the biggest challenges in changing uh, to relay cropping? Um, it's harvesting is where our biggest challenge is. It seems uh, with the RTK signals, we can get the beans like centered between the twin rows fairly decent. Um, it's harvesting is a challenge though, because you know, you're 50% less efficient because it's slower harvesting and you're playing with the head height a lot and you're not getting all the cereals kind of like, uh, you know, Pete said earlier in your video clip there that it's, it is a challenge to try to get as much of the cereals as you can, but just staying true. Like if your beans are wandering a little bit between the twins, it's hard to, you know, follow that header height. It's just the challenge of harvestability. Mm -hmm. For sure. Now, Scott, what do you think some of the, I mean, you've, you're obviously doing trials, but I mean, farmers are doing this. You're working with farmers who are trying it. What are some of the biggest holdups for, for adopting it? For relay cropping or just intercropping in general? Or inter um, intercropping, yeah. I would say it's the complexity uh, under all the stress of farming to begin with um, and trying to adapt to that and, and then cater to potentially uh, the market behind it who um, may feel like they're uh, getting a dirty product, say like, uh, you know, uh, some, some lentil chips inside their flax sample uh, and that can be an allergen for, for at least maybe in the soybean market. Um, and that's a big problem because everybody wants consistency. Uh, nobody wants complexity in the, in the business, uh, arena. Right. So. Yeah. It's, that is a good point. Um, certainly from the, from the intercropping side, you do have to separate them, but we all know, unless yeah. you're doing color sorting or something like that, I mean, it's, yeah. You are and you have to pay, to you have to pay for that, uh, the separation costs alone, uh, you need like 20% more yield per acre, uh, in order mm -hmm. to pay for that extra work. If, if you've got mm -hmm. a person on the cleaner and they're running it, uh, 12, 16 hours a day, trying to keep up to a combine, uh, and then you're paying payments on that new cleaner you got, this is, uh, this is crazy, but. You know, maybe yeah. if you can get 40% more yield per acre or 60 that we've seen and in, in some cases with peak canola, then it's going to pay. Yep. And it only pays when it rains. And when it doesn't rain, we right. don't seem to get the, the yield response that we normally get. You're from two very different places, but you're speaking the same language, right, Greg? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mother Nature gets the final say, uh, no matter what. Um, but it, I mean, it's a super good point that Scott about the economics, right? Is that more work? Uh, so whether it's more passes across the field, or more time to clean, or in Greg's case, when you're really cropping, if you're leaving grain in the field, um, there has to be something has to give somewhere. So there has to be an added yield bump. So you know, if we can get to those 100 bushel beans, um with a relay crop that's that's a slam dunk but uh, 20 isn't going to get you there get you there now ray brings up something that does harken back to even my early days in agriculture um ray debanko says i kind of dream back to my polymer coating days stop me if you've heard this one guys um induction system and a coat and coat a seed that can be planted at the same time as the primary crop but not germinate until a certain heat accumulation now we're talking guys so yes i love the idea of this and maybe one day this will come back around um to to work out something where in a single pass we could do all sorts of cool things with calling more coding coatings and timers i just imagine like but again they're almost all driven by water aren't they it's usually like there has to be some sort of water and then something dissolves and then that's how we get to instead of growing degrees right um Anyway, we'll see if that ever gets picked up. Uh, that actually, that's a great place to sort of leave it because we're running out of time. And Scott, thank you for sticking with us. I do appreciate it. Uh, Scott, I'll start with you. What is the one thing you really want to work on that you think uh, needs a bit more work, but you're hopeful about on this topic? Uh, I uh, I think there's some more room for, uh, at least in the pea canola system, to introduce alfalfa into that as well and uh bring in some longer scope rotation uh ideas and uh 
you know, trying to harness some of the uh, fixed nitrogen and then introduce cereals as uh, direct seeding until. Oh, we caught just the end of it. I'm going to fill in for him. Yeah, we got most of it, but I'm going to fill in the alfalfa feeds ruminants. And yes, you can get bovine, but you can also get sheep. Anyway, but I think I do happen to know being from Western uh, or where Scott is, they do certainly take into account that there are some pretty uh, large cattle herds in that area. And they are working to, yes, add grazing or add silage or add hay into the rotation as well for that. So um, I think we know where he's going with that. And uh, I like it because it brings livestock in. Okay, Greg, uh, what is the one thing you are super excited about or most hopeful for and want to see come to fruition in the next while? Um, I think we're going to keep trying to fine tune which is the right cereal for us, like which one's more consistently. Um, rye is almost five, six feet tall here, the common rye, so it makes harvesting a lot easier, but it does take um, most of the sunlight away from the soybeans. So trying to balance that out um i think our soybeans we have the right heat units now so just fine-tuning the cereal to make harvesting a little bit better so mm -hmm. all right um scott i extrapolated from where you froze to say if you're getting alfalfa in the rotation that means ruminants and i of course said sheep but Kara does remind me that there are also goats because she has goats but scott it's for cows isn't it uh well you can, if the goats or uh, sheep are going to eat it, that's great. I think it's a you supercharged plant. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you right now, it is wasted on on sheep anyway. Goats will, goats will probably eat it because they'll turn up their nose and just about everything. Um, all right. Okay. No. So, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. This is this has been fantastic. I did tell everyone to zip me an email if they want to see some of the research that you're doing at uh, Wado because it's super cool. Um, and, Greg, thank you for sharing so much that you do on Twitter. It is true. There is some pretty cool kit and there's some really neat stuff happening. So, love to see all this cool stuff happening in Ontario, Manitoba. Um, thank you to both of you. Thank you to everyone in the audience joining us on this July 4th. We will be back every Monday night except for the holiday Monday in August and uh, the September long weekend. Other than that, I'm here, so please come back. All right. Scott, thank you. Greg, thank you. And good night, everybody. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>